I mean, I am delighted to be able to introduce to you today um, two of the world's most renowned Arctic ecologists, um, Dr. Uh, Alexander Sokolov and Dr. Dorothy Eric. And, and, you know, this is a real treat for everybody. And I, I, I hope that you uh, enjoy and appreciate uh, the opportunity. So I'm just going to let them sort of get going. I'm not sure who's going first, but this is our second in a series of uh, ecology um, lectures. Um, this one is, is designated to be herbivores. Okay, so um, as uh, Peter just said, um, actually, or as he did not say, actually, there will be three speakers today. Oh. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and uh, introduce you the plan. Uh, so, uh, share screen. <laughs> yeah, here we are. So, do you see my screen? So, um, as Peter just said, the topic of today's lecture is climate change and herbivory in the Arctic. So, no, and um, we will be three speakers. I will start. So, my name is Dorothy Eric. I work at the UIT, the Arctic University of Norway in Tromsø, above the Arctic Circle. And uh, after that, uh, there will be a short part by Violetta Filipova, who is also working, who is working in the group of Alexander Sokolov in Labutnangi. And then uh, Alexander Sokolov will conclude. Um, so we don't have so much time, so let's start right away. Um, because we are quite a heterogeneous public, I thought I would start by a short introduction um, about who are actually herbivores in the Arctic. So as you just saw in the previous pictures, of course, ungulates are very important. The most widespread species are reindeer, or caribou, which are actually the same species uh, and just have different names in North America and in Europe. Then we have muskox, which are a really charismatic species a bit about which we will not speak anymore today. So these are the large herbivores, the ungulates, which are a very important group regarding their effect on the vegetation. Then we have a group of medium-sized herbivores, which is quite diverse where you have, for example, hares, marmots, muskrats, or this animal here, which is a pika. Um, the next group of herb vertebrate herbivores are birds. And um, so the main herbivorous birds are geese, which are widespread in the Arctic, and ptarmigan, which are basically two species, also year-round residents in the Arctic, eating almost only plants. Um, the next group is small herbivores, which are small, but as you will see later during this lecture, very important for the functioning of Arctic ecosystems. That's the small rodents. So we have lemmings, which occur only in the Arctic, and voles, which are often species which occur both in North Boreal and, Ar and low Arctic areas, but both groups are important. So these are the main, these are the main groups of vertebrate herbivores. But in addition, we also have invertebrate herbivores, which are maybe talked about much less than the vertebrates. But as you will see later in my lecture, maybe they will become more important in the future. So um, just looking a little bit more about diversity, vertebrate, diversity, vertebrate herbivore diversity in the Arctic um, is not distributed homogeneously in space. There are some regions, especially here in Western North America, where vertebrate diversity is higher. This is all species and this is only mammals. And there have been a few recent studies which had, have addressed the drivers of this vertebrate herbivore diversity. And um, they have found out that productivity or NDVI, if you remember last week's lecture, we talked a lot about NDVI, which is a proxy of greenness or of vegetation productivity. So productivity has a positive effect and to a certain degree also temperature. So um, keep that in mind because in principle, based on this one could predict that if climate change continues in the way it does with increasing temperatures and increasing vegetation productivity, 
possibly there will be an increase also in herbivore biodiversity. Now, in many cases, the impact of herbivores on Arctic vegetation is small. Many studies have documented this. On uh, the left side of this slide, there is an example which was based on studies at 17 sites in the Canadian Arctic and uh, looked at vertebrate herbivory. And the authors of this study concluded that on average, less than 20% of the proportion of plant, pro uh, less than 20% of plant productivity was actually used by herbivores. So actually just barely above 10. So only a small proportion of what grows every year is actually used by herbivores. Um, on the right side of the slide, there is a picture from a study that looked at um, invertebrate herbivory. Here, they also looked at 20 sites in the circumpolar Arctic and determined that the impact of invertebrate herbivory was actually even considerably lower than the impact of vertebrate herbivory. With, uh, if you have 5% here, you see that most sites are well below this. So on average, the impact of herbivory is maybe not that big in the Arctic. However, herbivory has very important other ways to impact the vegetation than just removing biomass. This is a slide from a conceptual paper by uh, René van der Waal that showed how increasing grazing pressure, and here he thinks about ungulates, reindeer, how increasing grazing by reindeer can drive state shifts in the tundra vegetation from a lichen dominated state here at low grazing pressure to a dwarf shrub and moss dominated vegetation state here at intermediate grazing pressure, and then to a graminoid or grass dominated vegetation state at high grazing pressure. And um, this is related both to the fact that, uh, not that much to the fact that herbivores are eating the vegetation, but a lot to the fact that they trample it, which destroys lichen, and that they fertilize it. And this is a kind of a scheme which illustrates all these combined processes where you have this, this idea that fecal deposition increases plant production, which then attracts herbivores, which then deposit even more feces. And this drives the system to more production. And at the same time, when there are a lot of herbivores, they trample the mosses and the lichen, which reduces the isolation of the soil which then increases soil temperature and again leads to more fertilization. So this is a theory which says that herbivores in a way engineer their environment and where they graze a lot, the grass will grow or the vegetation will grow more fertile. This is a slide which I think, or a picture which I think Mark showed last week in his lecture about vegetation changes. And uh, this is a slide that shows the type of grass rich and fertile vegetation which can start to grow in places where reindeers have been grazing intensively over many, many years. Now, this was, an, uh, this was a short introduction about um, herbivores in the Arctic in general. Of course, it's difficult to introduce such a wide topic in five minutes, but I hope you got at least a glimpse. So now in the further parts of this lecture, we will focus on two questions. So first, how does climate change in the Arctic affect herbivores and herbivory? But also, how does herbivory interact with climate change in driving changes of the Arctic vegetation? And we will focus now on these three groups of herbivores. Reindeer and Viola. Violetta will speak more about reindeer later and also Alexander. Small rodents. But to start with, I will now have a small part about this defoliating birch moth and defoliating insects. Um, so if you remember last week's lecture by um, Desheng that spoke about remote sensing, you have seen a couple of these pictures, which show, which use uh, large scale remote sensing data and this NDV, NDVI, uh, this index of vegetation productivity. And these pictures often show that in general, the Arctic is greening, but not everywhere. In some places, the Arctic is also browning. So this browning or this decrease in vegetation productivity in some areas has different causes. 
but one of the causes are increasing insect outbreaks because in some areas especially of the subarctic and low arctic insect outbreaks have been become more severe and one of the species which causes these insect outbreaks are birch moth so this is these are the larvae of the birch moth eating fresh small birch leaves and this on this picture here is the result of such a an outbreak in the subarctic birch forest in northern norway Now, cyclic outbreaks of defoliating birch moth are actually normal in the subarctic birch forest of Fennoscandia. And uh, there is this autumnal moth, which is the main species that has been having outbreaks every more or less 10 years, as long as this has been recorded. This is a time series of this 10 year cycle of the birch moth. Um, just for you who are not from our region of the world, the subarctic birch forest in Fenoscandia is distributed in this area here. So, but what has been happening now during recent years? These birch moth outbreaks have become much more severe. And um, in, these, in the years 2002 to 2008, there has been an outbreak of an unprecedented severity, which has lasted not only like one or two years, like the severe outbreak, breaks that were earlier, but for many years and over many square kilometers. And it has been discovered that this was actually due to warmer winters. This, this autumn moth, which has created outbreaks earlier, was the only moth present in northern Fenoscandia. But in recent years, a second species, the winter moth, has been spreading northwards. And um, this winter moth and also this moth here, um, their distribution is limited by winter temperature because their eggs do not tolerate temper very low temperatures. But as winters got warmer, winters got warm enough that actually the, temp the eggs of these two moths now also survive in our region. So as you can see here, over the last decades, this winter moth has expanded northwards. And because now there are two and soon also three species of these moths the, and the outbreaks of the different species are not synchronous. Because of this, the outbreaks last longer and become more severe. And while birch is adapted to survive a normal moth outbreak of a year or two, if the outbreaks become too severe, the birches die. And this is what is shown here. Uh, a moderate a moderate defoliation is possible to survive, whereas severe defoliation leads to death, or especially over time, leads to death for many species. Yes, and these moth outbreaks don't only kill the birches, but they actually lead to an ecosystem state shift affecting numerous other species. What you see here is that the understory vegetation also goes over from a dwarf shrub tundra dominated by um, for example, blueberry and other berries to a more grass dominated vegetation. And this in turn has consequences for many animals that use these areas. And the last point, which is interesting to keep in mind, is that this now seems not only to concern the birch forest in the subarctic anymore, but actually these moths start to move into the tundra. Uh, more and more, we observe that they also attack dwarf birch, which is a tundra species. And new, new results show now that the winter moth, this moth which has expanded northwards during the last decades, actually also attacks willows in the willow thickets. So, and yes, so um, it seems, or there is a concern that these outbreaks of um, defoliating insects will become a more important topic in the tundra with a warmer winter climate. Yes, so that's what I plan to tell you about a quite catastrophic, but at present quite limited aspect of herbivory in the tundra. With that, I pass the word to Violeta Filipova, who is going to tell you about how herbivory interacts with climate change to shape the tundra vegetation. Thank you very much, Dorothy. <clears throat> Should I share the screen now? 
Yeah, if you, your presentation and the OLAS are in the same file. Yeah, yeah. This, yeah, yeah, but share the screen, yes. Mm -hmm. mm. Is it working fine? Oh, stop share, sorry. Now, is that yes. working fine now? I Good. see it. Okay. okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Violeta Flipova, and I want to say about uh, interactions between climate change and herbivory affecting shrub expansions. Uh, climate warming currently causes changes in the physical and uh, biological characteristic uh, of the Arctic with the most uh, conspicuous Earth surface change being the shift toward increased shrub abundance in tundra landscapes. Increased shrub abundance uh, has the potential uh, to induce positive climate feedbacks through reduced albedo, increased ground temperature, and changes in a range of uh, biophysical processes. Uh, we can see uh, these cameras uh, on uh, on the left uh, uh, on the left top of slide, um, where we can see the influence of uh, different factors on uh, increased of uh, shrubs. Uh, and um, on um, temperature schema, uh, we can see um, uh, increased of summer warmth index by uh, about by two uh, degrees uh, for the period uh, 1960 uh, to 2018. <clears throat> uh, and uh, of course, uh, we uh, we consider that. Um, uh, uh, temperature increase of temperature is uh, the key factor of um, increasing of shrubs in tundra, and of course, um, uh, in the bottom of slide we can see uh, some um, some species of uh, willow. Uh, for example, uh, the most abundant uh, in Yamal Peninsula, in the southern of Yamal Peninsula, is Salix glauca, Salix lanata, Salix filicifolia. And uh, in the right uh, um, um, side of slide, we can see difference of uh, uh, shrub uh, increasing. Um, for example, uh, we can see uh, 20, uh, 22 years of shrub change. It's example from Canada. Um, and of course, uh, herbivores and willow shrubs, uh, shelter and food. Mm, uh, willow thickets are noticeable complex element in shrub tundra, which grow in the most productive parts of landscape and provide shelter and food for small herbivores all year. Willows are not well defended in comparison with alder, birch, uh, and evergreen shrubs, but they are a highly diverse group, containing varying uh, concentration of phenolic um, glycides, uh, uh, flavonoids, and <clears throat> polyphenols. Uh, and uh, largest herbivores animal of the tundra, reindeers, are able to trample a significant uh, percentage of willow records as well as other representatives of the circumpolar zone fauna. Of course, uh, we can see on this slide uh, not only reindeer and uh, muscles and uh, medium and small uh, herbivores. Uh, how uh, how said uh, how Dora said uh, willow termigan hair uh, lemmings and and walls and uh, they are leaf uh, they uh, they have uh, shelter and uh, in shrubs and of course uh, shrubs um, are food uh, for these herbivores. And uh, how can herbivore can change the shrub uh, expansion? Of course, how I said that uh, reindeers are able to trample uh, willow records, as well as other representatives of circumpolar zone, uh, zone fauna. A sign of the abundant impact of reindeers on willow thickets may be uh, the fragmentation of shrubs. Uh, livers of willow shrubs are one of the main uh, nutrition source for this um, herbivores in summer, since the deer can easily find the tops of the shrub towering in the snow. Uh, in the winter, reindeers prefer lichen. 
uh, smaller herbivores such as rodent, uh, lemmings and wolves, termigans, hares do uh, do more damage in winter as twigs are the only diet at this, at this time of year. And uh, the influence of the herbivore on shrubs covering the tundra ecosystems uh, depends on the size and density of herbivores population, the uh, intensity of grazing, feeding mode, migration, diet uh, compositions, and the phenology of plants. Uh, and on the slide, we can see the example of uh, this damage uh, by reindeers and uh, some project uh, which can uh, show that um, that uh, uh, small, uh, that um, medium and uh, large herbivore can um, uh, uh, can um, influence on growth of shrubs, and uh, such as a medium herbivores too. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Violeta. And I would like to share with you a few more slides and try to conclude in a short time. And I would like to ask Dorothy help at the end if I if we with Viola forget something really important. Uh, here we will we decide to show you uh, some results from the world famous paper from 2008 published in Nature where they analyzed the long term data about the rodent abundance in the in the Arctic uh, and uh, this is the map of Norway on the south of Norway and you can see that somewhere in the middle 90s the the lemming siles uh, start to fade in out which is shown Sasha, here. Sasha, sorry, your slides are not moving. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's not moving, but uh, I move my arrow. No? Can you see that? No. But we still see Violetta's first slide. Yeah. No. Violetta's first? Yes. Yeah. In impossible. Well, that's what I tell you. T try to check that we see the right yeah. screen. I think you uh, should share your other screen or something like that. Okay. Yeah. But uh, mm -hmm. let me... <laughs> is that uh, is do you that have two one? screens now on your computer no no i have just one yeah, now what... it's perfect now it's perfect there you go can you see the moving arrow yes yes yes, yes. Uh, you, should, you should interrupt us before should we go back no That's it's fine. fine i see i see okay so can you see the map of norway say yes or no all right this is the southern part of Norway and the long term uh, long term data about the rodents uh, uh, <laughs> follow the rodents density and you can see that somewhere in the middle 90s the the the, the cycles uh, stop to be so pronounced and they are not uh, they are not uh, so different between the years in the numbers and you can see here on the graphs and two main groups of uh, small herbivores lemmings and voles as uh, Dorothy and Viola mentioned before uh, Okay, how to move on now Is it moving? All right, sorry so and here the basically what they show in their paper uh, you see that the rodent peaks rate and the mean uh, rodents uh, so rodents abundance data are decreasing with the mean humidity with the increase in mean humidity in the climate and with the increase in mean hardness of snow the harder snow the wetter snow uh, lead to decline of the rodents. So it's a really first and published in a very well-known journal first sign on how climate could affect the, the, the Arctic herbivores, in particular the most important small herbivore. And uh, Dr. Erich is leading of the paper which was called by Arctic Council and the special program of Arctic Council, which is conservation of Arctic flora and fauna. She's heroically unite 49 sites which uh, uh, 38 of which are still active, which have a long-term data, a circumpolar about dynamics of rodents. And we are so proud to be a part of this, of this uh, work here in Yamal. And uh, I invite you all to read that, of course, in detail, but the, sorry, Dorothy is probably not the main conclusion, but one of the important conclusion is that we don't find evidence uh, that lemmings population were decreasing in general in for the whole arctic 
but we find a negative trend uh, in the Arctic populations which were sympatric with voles. You need to know that voles not goes yet so far north as lemmings. So they are newcomers from the south in the Arctic, the voles. And uh, is it moving now, Doro? And now I congratulate to you all, dear students, because you are the first in the world who can see this slide, but you should promise not share this news because the data is not published yet. So here you can see uh, the effort of Natalia Sakalova, the employer of our station, to, you, to summarize the 50 years of following rodents population in Yamal. Here you can see the map of Yamal with the base of trapping and with the uh, with the different subzones in the Yamal, probably in the previous lectures, you know that we have southern tundra in the south and the Arctic zone, subzone tundra in the north. So, what are these? Uh, you can see this probability to trap these rodents during that 50 years. For the red zone now, please uh, see what is. Oh, no, no, it's to the south from the red zone in the forest tundra zone where the Labatnangi is actually. You can see that a few forests in the patches of tundra. And you see that the probability to get the Siberian lemming, for example, is decreasing for the years, but uh, as well as the probability to get the colored lemming. There are two species here in Yamal. And for the next zone, which is red on the map, the subzone, what we call shrubby tundra zone. And we can see that the, to, the probability to get the lemming is also decreasing, but the voles are increasing over the years. To, uh, you, you, more often you can get the vole now if you trap the rodents there. And if you go for the north, unfortunately for lemmings, but luckily for voles, the trends are similar. So lemmings declining and the voles uh, increasing. And here is the most northern uh, area, even in the high Arctic, in the, this green area where until two the year 2000, you in, in you was not able to meet any voles, but now they are increasing dramatically and almost near nearly every attempt to get the, to trap the rodents, you can get them. So I hope you will remember that we here in Yamal trying to detect some trends using our geographical position and long term data, 50 years of data. And another example come again from Norway, one of the, as Peter absolutely right said, one of the world leading science, Arctic science uh, researchers and from Svalbard or Spitsbergen, how it's called in, in Russian more often, where the uh, researchers uh, use the data from 10 reindeer populations, which are from dozens to hundreds of kilometers apart. And for us in Yamal, it's not easy to, 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 to think that some of the population are coastal, but some inland, but anyway, some are more coastal as green here or red, and some are more, co more inland and more coastal as blue here. And uh, uh, for the all population in, in, in the Svalbard, they find the trend that the rain on snow event here in millimeters, rains which fall on the snow, you know that from the first election, it's actually decreasing the productivity or uh, different parameters of rangers and increase the, their mortality for the obvious reasons for the icing on the ground surface. But uh, dear students, you should not think that the picture is so simple and th there is a much more difficult picture and more puzzles there. And authors perfectly show it. They compare, as you say, you are the inland and coastal population. And if they compare rain on snow events, summer temperatures, or other different parameters, you see that they are slightly or not slightly different, and which lead to different um, um, different influence on different populations. And you can see, for example, here that rain on snow event much more. Uh, much stronger affect the coastal population than the inland population. And I think I will skip this long, not boring, fantastic text, but to save the time for better for questions. And again, you can, you can read the paper to see the, the, the recording afterwards and find the paper. And just the, as a final slide, I would like to show you our joint studies with Dorothy and with researchers from NASA when we uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, where the register the rain on snow event and the Yamal, you can see here the black area, it's the area affected by rain on snow. 
with the dots is the meteor stations ground true validation and if the dot is red that was a liquid precipitation in november 2013 and if it's an empty circle it was no rain so you see that the nasa satellites and the and the russian ground true weather stations working quite fine together here and uh, brave russian researchers were were in this black area in the december and we really find this thick uh, uh, layer of ice on the ground surface and according to officials there is different estimates as i tell you probably a few lectures ago that it was a big catastrophe for the local people and uh, quite many rangers died and now dear peter i slowly go to other lection the, to, to to the next week lection you will understand why it's important it's not about plant herbivore anymore but more uh, about the another food chain levels that the, these dead rangers we believe and we prove that lead to survival of new species or coming of new species to the arctic as the red foxes and this was the very very first and so far the only year among our 20 years in Yerkuta when the red foxes are breeding and very first time we find the hooded crow breeding there uh, only now i recognize that we should have last slide something like thank you we have know this but i thank you all yeah Th maybe Th sasha then because we i think have quite good time maybe i actually say just a few summarizing words in the end you should do uh, that should i peter this... or please yeah so you should do that Dorothy, i, I then... didn't prepare any summarizing slides but um i think um I would like to just point out a few general trends which uh, were exemplified now by the examples we went through. So, um, I mean, there are general principles how climate change influences herbivores and the impact herbivores have or the interactions they have with vegetation changes. So if the first, what I tried to show with my example is that because of warmer climate, new species come to the Arctic and they start to interact together with the species we have there already. Um, then the herbivores also, I mean, what um, the climate impacts not only through temperature, but also through precipitation. And that was very clear in what Sasha told. Um, one very important aspect is this icing in winter. And because when precipitation in winter comes not as snow, but as rain, and then this is followed by frost, then you have this icing, which prevents herbivores from accessing their food. So this has catastrophic consequences, both for small and for large herbivores. What is, however, very interesting in Svalbard today is that in Svalbard, winters have sometimes become so warm that instead of ice, the snow just melts away and bare patches appear where the reindeer can graze. And in principle, although rain and snow events are becoming more frequent on Svalbard, reindeer populations are actually increasing, both because of this, the warmer climate in summer, which leads to higher vegetation productivity, and because of these super warm winters, which sometimes lead to bare patches in winter. So climate change is unexpected and not linear, and more and more of so-called ecological surprises will appear. And to yeah, summar yeah. some, yes, yes, go ahead. And and to summarize the last point, how herbivores interact with uh, with climate change to shape the vegetation. Viola's example was very nice, who showed that climate change drives shrub expansion. We have seen a lot about that in uh, Mark's presentation last, and also Mary's presentation last week. Mm -hmm. But reindeer impact shrub expansion a lot. And when there is high density grazing of reindeer, like we have in Northern Fenascandia and we, like we have in some places in Yamal, shrubs can actually not recruit. The small shrub recruits are grazed on constantly and they cannot emerge from the grass layer. Reindeer also trample shrubs and actually can reduce to, a, can lead to a reduction of a willow thicket extent. So they, through management of reindeer in a way, uh, shrub expansion can be locally counteracted. Yes, that's sort and of... Peter, if we can, Viola would like to add also, Liza, concluded for one minute. Please. Yes, and uh, <laughs> yes, I, would, I want to add that uh, 
if you remember, I told about that uh, uh, reindeers mostly reduce uh, uh, reduce willow shrubs and other shrubs too. But uh, I wanted to add that um, they uh, they can uh, fertilize. Uh, uh, the soils, because uh, I think that it can be connected with uh, uh, the different um, husbandry systems, uh, um, reindeer, system, uh, reindeer husbandry systems. Because, for example, in some countries, so for example, in Finland, um, uh, fenced uh, husbandry um, uh, is, uh, is more uh, predominant uh, than, in, for example, in Yamal, where Rendias uh, more under control um, of nanets uh, of people uh, who has this husbandry, of course. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Peter, now I think we are done. Great. Um, but well, we would be happy to answer some questions. Yeah, yeah but first, I want to, I, I hope everybody will join me in thanking um, Dorothy, Sasha, and of course, Violetta for wonderful presentation. <laughs> But please ask your questions in the chat box. And th there is two options. If everyone understand everything, no questions. So no one understand nothing. This is no, so no questions. <laughs> but I hope this is not the second option. <laughs> Come on, guys, this is your chance to ask questions of the of of, world of course, authorities. There are many more kind of, there are many more aspects we could have highlighted. So it was a bit, uh, yeah, picking just a few examples. Yes, and uh, another explanation, no questions, because it's too early again in the other part of the world. <laughs> Wake yeah. up, guys. Oh, here we go. Um, yeah, here I see a question. Are there any efforts to control the expansion and outbreak of moths in the Arctic? Uh, no, there are no efforts to control the outbreak of moths. However, there are studies going on on how to best deal with the consequences. What should you do with the half devastated forest? Is it better to log it? Is it better to remove the logs? Is it better to leave them? So it's more at this mitigating the consequences level. Then there are more questions. Can you explain uh, more how more animal husbandry impacts the effects of reindeer? Well, do you, uh, who the wants question to goes to Violetta, probably. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, she's, she's trying to say, I think it was quite nice explanation that the different parts of the world have a different reindeer herding practices where they uh, it's also a mistake to believe that they are nearly wild in Yamal. They are controlled very much by ranger herders, but there are majority of them, absolute majority of them have no fences. So it's a much more, much more effort actually to herd them as far as I understand. I, of course, uh, the Stenoscandians army will not uh, agree with me, but there is different practices with the ranger husbandry all around the Arctic. And then, uh, if, if and I, I, I could, so. I could add a precision. Maybe not everybody knows, but there's reindeer on Svalbard or on Spitsbergen, which Sasha spoke about in the end, are actually wild reindeer. Yes. Oh yeah. Uh, and they are a different subspecies, like you saw in the mm -hmm. pictures. They are really short and round, and um, yeah, so they are and, not uh, herded. And, and also, they move very little. They actually mm -hmm. only move a few even not 100 meters per day in the winter. So that because mm. of that, it actually makes sense to classify them into coastal and inland over uh, distances of some tens of kilometers. Mm -hmm. For example, but overall guys, we would like to keep you excited because I'm sure in the future, it will be more lectures from our anthropologists also, and you will learn uh, way more about ranger husbandry in Yamal in particular. So I see there are some more questions about moths here. Is there a situation in which the moth population is beneficial to the environment? So in fact, here I would say, you know, beneficial to the environment is actually a human construct. Um, the moth outbreaks are of course beneficial to the moths, but they're detrimental to the trees and to the plants. Mm -hmm. So, um, but what you can say is that they lead 
what I showed in the end of my presentation. If the moth outbreaks are very dramatic, they can lead to state shifts in the environment from this a birch forest with dwarf shrub understory to more grassy vegetation. And this is detrimental for some species, for example, for the birds that breed in these trees. But it's beneficial for other species that like to graze on the grass. So it's always, I mean, in principle, we ecologists try to talk about different states of the environment more than speaking of good and bad. Are the moth outbreaks related with wind speed? There are some flying insects that are sensitive to high wind speed. Yeah, and uh, here I must say, I don't know. Um, but interesting question. Uh, are there any other herbivore insects that have large influence on Arctic vegetation? At present, not. Uh, like you saw the picture which I showed on the second or third slide about the impact of background herbivory from invertebrates in the Arctic. In most sites, the impact of uh, invertebrate herbivores is really, is really low at present. How might the increase in voles and decrease in lemmings affect the levels of rodent herbivory? That's a really interesting question. Actually, it does. Um, they have different diet. And um, now looking at, well, probably looking not only at Fenoscandia, but it's super obvious in Fenoscandia. Lemmings are quite big and uh, lemmings have evolved to cope with little nutritious food. And they really eat a lot of little nutritious food. So lemmings in a way, when they have peak densities, devastate the vegetation. You can see really big grazing traces. They remove a lot of vegetation. They cut a lot of dwarf shrubs. They cut a lot of dry grasses because they eat the growing points of the grasses. So they really, in a way, disturb, but also open space for new plants to recruit. Voles are smaller and they are probably they're more selective in their diet. They, although they can reach high densities, they occupy probably a smaller proportion of the landscape. And they don't have this really strong, like visible at the landscape level impact on the vegetation. Hmm. So yes, I think it is actually a quite important consequence for the grazing impact too of this uh, small road and community transition. Yeah. And also about their importance for the predators, because uh, lemmings in general have a more density in spring, while voles in the fall. So for breeding snow voles and arctic fox, world famous examples also important. When is having more shrubs a good thing versus a bad thing? Yeah, interesting question that too. Are there some areas where shrub expansion should be prevented versus encouraged? So, I mean, shrubs are on one hand, they're productive, but the tundra and tundra animals are usually an open landscape. So if you think, for example, about avian biodiversity with a lot of um, waders, for example, that are ground nesting birds adapted to open landscapes, these birds will not grow in a shrubland uh, or these birds will not nest in a shrubland. On the other hand, other birds will come in more north boreal or boreal bird species when you have shrubs to build nests on. So in a, in a way it's again it's not good and bad but if everything gets covered with shrubs the arctic landscape will disappear because the arctic is limited to the north by the arctic ocean so you cannot just but, move the biogeographic zones hey guys i have a funny example uh, i believe our morning visitority uh, started from the same thing now in yerkuta in our long-term monitoring uh, station we have two animals with satellite colors one is red fox one is arctic fox and daily we can follow where they are and it is very obvious that, for example, red foxes are always hiding on the long willows while arctic foxes are on the open area. This is a totally new knowledge for us and we share yes. it with you That's now. That's very, and very it's, cool. It's, it's again, it's unpublished. Keep it a secret inside our group. 
Um, so one more question. So from what I understand is that new species, voles, insects, are starting to move northwards and competing with those who are already there. Have you seen that they are invasive to the current animals and insects? Um, well, I don't usually call these species invasive. I think they are expanding, but I don't think they have all the components which you would use for a typical invasive species, at least not for the vol the voles I would definitely not call invasive um, because they kind of, yeah, they expand gradually. They are not in a way introduced from another area of the world. Um, they don't have this, some invasive species, you know, when they come to a new continent, they really have this super advantage that none of the other species are adapted to um, either hide from them if they're predators or compete with them if they're plants, for example. I don't think we really see that. Although, for example, red foxes, the, what, what uh, Sasha was talking about, are called invasive by some people. So some of them are a bit at the edge, maybe, to be invasive. It's always how you, I mean, many, many words in, eco, in ecology have a quite strict definition. And in that sense, I would not call these species invasive. And then they are used in a bit more, yeah, wider sense by many people, especially in maybe policy-related texts. Yeah, I can try for the what, what bird species have been hit hard, hardest by early climate change? Well, the the first example come to my head is that uh, if we are talking today, it's it's don't forget was about herbivory and about plants again. So if they try to imagine the shrubs expand to the north, marsh to the north, then the open areas, as Dorothy say, are shrinking. And the open areas are the native areas for charismatic snow owls, for example. If there are no open space, all growth by shrubs, no snowy walls. And there are a few examples of decline. And for example, again, in Yamal, we, rec re we record moving of south in the border of breeding of this species, hundreds of kilometers from south to the north. And there is actually then another lecture could be done about the birds and um, uh, we also proud together with Dorothy co-author in the paper about the 10 years study by lead by Vasily Sakalov about changes of bird communities in our long term area where the, we hy hypothesize that the widespread species who is connected with the willows again will occupy the areas which were uh, occupied before by the open open livers, or how to say that. Sorry for my English, guys. Actually, but, uh, can... yeah. No, no, go ahead, Dorothy. I could just add something. I mean, one thing which is observed is that there is a declining trend in many Arctic breeding waders. And also there is a declining trend in quite a few ptarmigan populations. And this is on the one hand, maybe related to habitat change, like uh, Sasha was suggesting, another um, hypothesis, but it, get, it is getting some support, is that it is related to the increase in generalist predators. So that's something we will come back to in the next lecture about predators in the Arctic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just one more last question. Um, I'm, I'm just curious if somebody could answer why it is that the coastal reindeer are more susceptible to rain on snow events than the inland ones. Because there are more often rain on snow events in the coast when inland. Okay. I think. Doro? Uh, well, you have been presenting that. Now I haven't read that paper just yesterday, so I don't draw. Yeah, I don't as, know. As, as I understand, Peter, the frequency of rain on snow events on the shore higher than inland. Okay. That makes sense. All right, well, it looks like we are about done with time. Um, again, thank you everyone for your questions and especially uh, Dorothy, Sasha and Violetta for the wonderful presentation. And, um, oh, one more thing. Uh, I have a, um, a, uh, a link that I'm going to post in the chat box before everybody leaves. I can find it um, from the last 
from, from Alexei Shishushkov on uh, infographics on permafrost thawing, in case you're interested. And of course, these lectures, this lecture will be available uh, on the, uh, the YouTube page, but I promise uh, Sasha that uh, it's, it's not open, so only the people in the class can, can have access to it if we give it to them. So don't worry about unpublished stuff. So thank you again, everyone, and have a wonderful week. Thank you, and, and have a good week. See you next thank week. Thank you for the great experience. Thanks. Oops. Sasha, может останемся на две секунды? Может, лучше WhatsApp вызовем? Давай. Давайте.